So our next speaker is going to be Robert Wilson, and he's going to do the GoGo project. GoGo? GoGo, yes. Go, uh, lessons Excuse learned building my first CTF. And, uh, but first, I want to take a moment to thank our Go Level sponsors. And they are St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, and Sales. And now Robert's going to continue. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. So my name is Robert Wilson. Today I'm going to talk you through sort of a case study of a project I did recently. Um, this was kind of a combination CTF scavenger hunt that uh, started. It started out based on inspiration from some of the stuff they're running at DEF CON, where you have people running all over the place, right? Stuff like the Fox Hunt. Um, where you, it wasn't a traditional CTF in the sense that you couldn't sit in one place and solve everything. You'd have to you know, move somewhere else, find something, and that was your next clue in the puzzle. I thought that was super cool. And I thought it would be neat to do something like that over a longer time span, make people get up and move. And I, I especially liked the idea of having this narrative that drove the training, the exercise, and got you interested, right? Kept you engaged. Uh, plus, I've found that if there's something I want to learn, one of the most effective ways uh, to learn it is to tell everyone, hey, um, I, I know this, and I'm going to give a, uh, I'm going to make a workshop for it, and you can do that in a month. And now I've got a month to uh, build a workshop. So that's a good way to get myself moving. So my two motivations for this were, really my primary motivation was to learn some stuff myself and then to play with this idea um, and see what people thought of it. So, uh, in my opinion, this didn't. This wound up kind of tanking, in my opinion. And I'm going to talk about why I think that is, but it also got me thinking about uh, what makes effective training. And uh, I, I used to be an elementary school teacher before I got involved in InfoSec, and now I'm responsible for a lot of training in my organization. So it got me thinking about what makes effective training and uh, how to get people engaged and. Uh, deliver something that's consistent and gives value, right? So uh, this is sort of uh, open season. You might have noticed from the description that I'm looking for input. So I'm definitely looking for your feedback when I get to the end here. Uh, so we're gonna walk through context. We're gonna walk through kind of some of my ideas about teaching uh, and learning. Uh, some of the challenges of building a training like this, uh, which this is the first time I built something on this scale. Uh, and, and it's not particularly big, so that's not saying much. Uh, there's five challenges. They're each, the names will make a little more sense in a second. And I'll, I'll kind of walk through what I learned. So for context, this guy up in the corner is Nikolai Gogol, who's a Russian writer. He wrote a story about a Russian bureaucrat buying dead people to commit tax fraud. Um, it's an entertaining book. But one of the things, his character in this book basically spends his time driving from place to place to meet all these people, convince them to sell him their dead servants so he can report that to the Russian government and get a, a tax rebate. Uh, so I thought, well, that's, you know, he had to move from place to place. It's kind of cool. Russian names kind of sound kind of cool. That's a, something I can use to uh, provide the backdrop for the CTF and give it some kind of narrative. So uh, that's just something I went with. Um, and then that second comment on this slide, right, was to what I said earlier. Uh, if you can't do something, uh, go build a lesson on it. You'll, you'll learn. All right, so coming from teaching, these are some of the quotes that got kind of drilled into us when I was training for that job. Um, the top one, Socrates, is basically saying that 90% of the time, the student knows or is capable of figuring out what you're trying to teach him. And he was talking about basic math, right? Uh, and he was basically saying, you don't need to explain to the student that four plus four equals eight, because really they know that. You just need to ask them the right questions to make them realize they know that. And everyone's had that feeling when they're working through a problem and something clicks and you go, oh, duh, right? Uh, how did I not see this at first? And the rest of these quotes kind of get at the same point. So John Milton Gregory is uh, someone who wrote a lot about teaching and he said, uh, questioning is pretty much, that's the be all end all. Um, and you shouldn't tell the student anything that they can figure out for themselves. And uh, I think offensive security is uh, 
classic line is really just a reiteration of that. Um, this is a look at different ways you can teach people things. So Socratic kind of covers that concept of questioning we talked about earlier. Um, but you know, what's the alternative when we say that you shouldn't teach the student something they can't figure out themselves or you should be asking questions? Well, what else would you do? Uh, one thing you can do is do some hands-on teaching, kind of like the software-defined radio workshop that I was messing with this morning. Right, so give them something concrete to turn over, break, in my case mostly break, and uh, mess with, and that's a good way for them to learn. It gives them an opportunity to learn by experience, right? Uh, really that makes them come up with their own questions, uh, and that's pretty effective. A lot of people learn well that way. They're Socratic, where you're asking the question and then sending the student out to figure out the answer. Uh, Google it, RTFM is another popular phrase, right? <laughs> uh, so, dialectical is you're telling, right? So uh, here, good morning, my name is Robert Wilson, I'll be your teacher today, and I'm here to inform you that four plus four equals eight. Memorize that, because you'll be tested on it at the end of the month. Uh, so what I think really is most effective, it, it, when I run exercises like this, I found that the biggest thing that tends to be a problem for me is I'll start out with something Socratic, Socratic and hands-on, I'll ask a question, I'll give them a problem to mess with, right? And then when I get to the end, I'll cycle on to the next project. Uh, so I think that what you need is kind of a combination of all these things. Because if you're in a position where you're training people for your organization, chances are you're not in charge of who you hire and fire. And your job is just to get all of these people to a common baseline, right? Which means that if people learn in different ways, it's really going to wind up being on you to figure out how to bring them there. And so you've got to kind of employ all these. And and whereas you could do something like a just hands-on, right? So you come to my organization and, oops, excuse me. Uh, you, I say set up a web pen test challenge and say, all right, you've got Google, you've got a week. If you can figure this out, then you're done with training. I'll push you through, right? Um, that you'll, you'll weed out a lot of your real highly motivated folks and you'll get a, a very engaged body of people coming out of it. Uh, you can just, excuse me, just ask a series of questions. Uh, but you got to, you don't have the option of deciding that you're just going to, you basically, you've got to do your best to get people through uh, if they're willing to work with you, right? And so what I find winds up being effective is you give them that challenge. You ask them a few questions. You get them to work with it. And then you sit down with them afterwards and you say, look, here are the answers and do you kind of see where your gaps in logic work, right? That's your dialectical piece. And then you give them another similar challenge and let them work through that. And that, I think, is, is an effective way to go. So you folks, uh, I'm kind of doing this backwards with you because I'm talking to you about the CTF, so I'm just going to give you, hey, this is what it was, uh, and you're missing most of the rest of it. So this, you could say, is a bad example. Uh, all right. so. Summing that up, right? Uh, learning is exercise, basically. It's strenuous. You sh the students should be working to hunt down the answers because uh, it's going to make it stick. Your role is to ask the right questions as a teacher, and then I think you can use this hybrid model to get them interested, uh, get them to build experience working hands on with what you're trying to teach them, and then solidify that learning afterwards with a kind of a dialectical review. Um, again, you still have to watch your stragglers. Uh, and I think I think Socrates would have been all about CTS. So, some of the challenges. Uh, these were the three big criteria I was thinking about when I was working through this CTF. Uh, one consistent, right? It's no good if um, I tell you to give me the flag from this exercise and it's not going to be the same time every time you go and get it, right? That's why hashes, uh, you know, hashing a file or something that is like that is a really popular way to run these CTS. So keeping it consistent. Uh, keeping it contained, which can go, it, you got to be careful with this one because if you lock people down too much, they get bored because they feel like you're just sort of, you're leading them on a leash, right? Uh, but you are, at least in this room, we're teaching people who are hackers in the sense that they like to break things, um, in the sense that they particularly like to break your things. And so you've got to think about how to set up an environment where they can play around, they can mess up, 
they can uh, explore their different options and learn by making mistakes without destroying the environment for everyone else. Uh, so it's something to consider. And then the last question and probably the most important thing is investment. Because uh, in the end, who really cares what you're trying to teach them, right? Uh, you get, you'll get some people coming through your program who are there because they love this stuff and they want to improve and they want to do something themselves. You'll have some people who are coming through because there's some reward at the end of it for them. You'll have some people coming through because uh, they don't want to fail, I guess, or there's some penalty if they don't make it, right? Um, getting that investment, it's always best to find some way to make this the student's idea. So in, in fourth grade, right, it was always a big deal to get them excited about whatever we were reading, excited about math. Um, chess was my favorite. I had fourth graders crowded around a chess table as if it were a football team or a football game, just yelling at each other. It was fantastic because they're all very invested, right? They were they cared about what was happening and what the result was going to be. Uh, so that's important. All right, work it through. Promise. So score one. How do you get them started? You got to give them some kind of hook, right? Uh, there's some necessary information that they're going to have to have to um, get moving. And uh, it, this I'm speaking specifically about building something like a CTTF, right? Uh, whether it's here's the scoring server and here's your first box, right? If you were playing the Facebook CTF uh, that happened recently, you close the link and now you've got a binary file like I have something to start working with. And they'll typically say something like, oh, there's a picture in here, right? Uh, that one I still have, like low-level trauma from that particular exercise. That's just the one that's sticking in my head. Uh, but, so you give them the necessary information. You give them any hints or aids they need to kind of get rolling. And then uh, you give them this narrative hook, in this case, I think is important. Uh, I like CTS that tell a story. Uh, I, I think it's fun if you can make your student feel like, uh, like they're part of some kind of, some kind of narrative, like they're a, a hacker in the sense of being in a hoodie behind the computer because secretly uh, I think most of us find that thrilling. But get them into the sense that they are a protagonist, right? Uh, and that what they're doing is, is not just difficult but rewarding. So for uh, this particular project, what I gave them is I gave them a PDF of Dead Souls, old book. Um, required them to read it before, no I didn't. Uh, I gave them that, I gave them an IP address, I gave them a username, and I gave them SSH keys. Uh, all of which I will give to you at the end if you want to play with one or two of these challenges afterwards. And then I threw them in the first challenge. And so really, when I made this announcement, I just threw it out onto the organization Slack. I said, folks, we're doing this thing called Project Google. Um, here are all the resources you'll need. And gave like a very minimal introduction. And the thought I was going with was, let's see if this sparks some curiosity. I worked with a lot of folks who uh, like to dissect things like this. So maybe I can spark curiosity and I'll make, I'll make that my hope. Uh, so this particular one kicked off. I threw up a uh, VM in Azure with a few Docker containers on it. And where this started, right, I told you the whole point behind this initially was that I kind of wanted to learn some stuff. And so I was like, well, I kind of want to learn a little more about how Docker works. So how can I build a Docker escape lab? Um, so the way this sequence wound up working was you you would SSH into this Alpine container, um, and then it was how many people in here are real familiar with Docker? How many people in here know what Docker is? That's really the question I'm getting at. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> All right, so there's a basically there's a socket in Docker that you never want to expose to your containers because it's actually the socket that the Docker process uses to uh, manage your containers, right? Whenever you write Docker run or something, um, the Docker service is actually making an HTTP request, uh, an API call to a uh, socket on your box. And so if you were to mount that socket inside your container, well now they can make API calls to that socket and they can do anything from uh, generate other containers on your machine. Basically it's instant proof. Um, and that kind of led to my first problem, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. So I thought, cool, docker.sock, hey, that's 
that's cool. Not a, uh, I didn't know about it at least. It's fairly entry level, I guess, for a lot of the doctor students out there. But I thought it was cool. Um, it's a, it's easy to build, relatively speaking, or so I thought. Uh, and it'll be neat exercise. It'll teach people something. So the process for this basically was they had to log into Alpine. They would figure out that docker.soc was exposed, and then they would use REST queries to get credentials for this other Postgres container that was up there and uh, steal something out of the database. <coughs> First problem I ran into uh, was one of the areas I mentioned earlier is how do I contain this? I just threw, A, I'm, it's minus your VM, right? So whatever happens to this is kind of it's really only going to hurt me if someone decides, hey, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to absolutely trash your, uh, your Azure. So, hey, I don't really want them to mess around with my stuff uh, more than I want them to. Uh, B, how do I keep them from messing with other users? And so, uh, what I did for the users is this: these two lines of the batch you see, three lines. Um, basically, and I've seen people do this in CTS before, so this was. Handy. I, I'd always wondered how they did this. Um, wrote a brief script that opens up a non-persistent container for you, right? And then made that your login shell. So every time you log in, it spins you up a non-persistent Docker container. And now you're in your little box. When you log out, your box will be deleted. And you can't mess with anyone else's little box. Um, so, that worked. Uh, I'm sure that there's someone out there figure out a way around this. But I thought that was pretty cool. That worked real well for me. Uh, so I did that. And then the other issue I had, the more pressing one, was, well, I'm by its very nature, this CTF I've got set up gives you root, right? I'm exposing this docker.soc. So how do I let uh, how do I let the challenge proceed without letting you annihilate everything uh, when I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom? And so I looked around and I found this project, which it just hit me. I did not put in my references slide, but if you look up HA proxy, these folks uh, wrote a container that you can stick in between. So you basically mount your uh, your real Docker.soc inside of this container, right? And then you create a safe socket. Uh, it's just another socket, right? It creates another socket that you can link your Alpine to. And it just, all it's doing is when it gets requests, if it's a post, it's throwing it out. So it's only allowing this stuff through, it's not going to break anything, uh, or potentially allow for something like privilege escalation. And that worked like a charm. So they could use get requests to get information they weren't really supposed to have about this other Postgres container, which is what I wanted them to do, but they couldn't mess with the underlying VM. Uh, so that was solid. That was a good containment solution. Except I forgot something. So again, I have to say the last part of this challenge, you log in, you use the API calls to look at all the arguments they used to spin up this Postgres container, right? One of those arguments was the password. So you now, uh, if you use the default Postgres username, the password, now you've got access to the uh, database. So, I mean, who sees the, what I missed with containment? Anyone? Well, I realized afterwards uh, there was nothing stopping them from just dropping the table or I didn't include right or replacing the clue or doing whatever. No one did that, but I don't know. It still bugs me. I haven't fixed that yet, incidentally, and this challenge is up for people to play with, so please don't do that. Uh, anyway, so consistently with solid, everything, all this stuff stayed up real reliably. Um, output was consistent, containment was okay. Uh, the only issue with containment really was that Postgres. Um, investment wound up being the issue, and this was sort of where I think the exercise failed. Um, turns out that if you say, hey, username IP credentials, uh, that people don't necessarily go, oh yeah, this is what I want to do with my weekend. So uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how I think I could have made that buy in a little better, but we didn't get a whole lot of participants, and that affected everything from here on out. So, once you get into that database, you find some uh, latitude longitude coordinates, right? And those latitude longitude coordinates led you to two NFC tags on the bottom of the picnic table, and those NFC tags had a small bitmap. Um, 
This was cool because I'd always wanted to play with NFC tags. Uh, it turns out they're super frustrating, but it's still cool. So you find the tags, you pull out this picture. Uh, I threw in a PS1 script because I wasn't really sure how to hint uh, at what was going on otherwise. And uh, then you decode a URL that leads you to the next challenge, right? And this is kind of what was going on. So for the big map, we have this little PDQ. The, uh, the folks are going to get mad at me just to keep walking off the camera. So the YouTube video is just going to be this blank or whiteboard back here. Um, anyway, you, you pull open this little Pikachu image, and if you start dropping the hex, uh, this is basically how a bitmap works. Over here, the uh, 0A offset, you've got the offset of the image bind, so it tells you where the image starts, and then here's where you have your actual image. And so what I did is I used the least significant bit steganography, so each of the last bits in each of these bytes was flipped one way or another to encode a URL, um, which is something that's kind of uh, hard to figure out on the face of it, at least for me. I'm sure there's lots of folks who look at this and go, oh, well clearly, this is least significant bit steganography. I'm not one of those people. And so I wound up also throwing in an uncommented copy of the PowerShell that I wrote to do this. And so basically what they had to do was look at the picture, look at the PowerShell script, figure out what it was doing, and then write something to reverse it, right? Um, this was cool. I think uh, investment on this was solid. I got to watch this guy in the front crawling around under picnic tables for a while, which was fantastic. Uh, and, and I think that stuff like this, honestly, stuff where you surprise someone, they're expecting to sit at their desk and mess with something on the web, and suddenly you throw a latitude longitude coordinates or um, some clue like that, right? Where they've got to get up and get moving, and it suddenly feels like they're in, uh, I don't know, James Bond seems like a stretch, but you know what I mean. <laughs> right, suddenly they've got to get moving. I think that's great for investment. I think that gets people excited. Uh, consistency was great, you can lock NSC tags. I guess. The problem with containment, uh, that first bullet is optimistic. The problem with containment is I guess you could just yank the NFC tag and leave, uh, which would be a jerk move, but there's nothing I can do to stop you from doing that. Um, containment, these sort of challenges where you give someone a file to are solid for containment because everyone's got their own copy. It's not gonna, no one's gonna be messing with each other really. They're not sitting on the same machine to do their analysis. Anyway, you get through this, uh, you decode this bit that, and now you're off to Spakovich. Uh, this is one of the challenges I'm least happy with, uh, sort of because it just devolved. Um, I wanted it to be a DNS reconnaissance challenge. Uh, something else I didn't know much about. I was like, I want to make you go uh, map out the DNS footprint for this domain and find a flag that way. So for the hook, you pulled off of that uh, picture, Sabakovich to XYZ, which is a domain of bot. Um, a to C or what a deal. Uh, so you would set up this, if, and you try to go directly to it, it would bounce you. If you scan it, you realize SSH is open. If you use the SSH credits from the beginning, you can log in. Except you can't log in because the jump box up here, uh, shell for Nostriov, is been false. Uh, what you can do is set up an SSH tunnel. Right, so if you set up an SSH tunnel, now you've got access to the stuff behind it. Um, and I did, the reason I don't think this was great was because none of that's really intuitive, um, and you could spend a really long time trying to troubleshoot why SSH isn't working. Uh, so what I wound up doing was throwing some hints in the banner, uh, basically saying we can do an SSH tunnel. Um, and that, I, I mean, it sort of breaks it breaks the narrative, right? But uh, that's why I wasn't super happy with this one. But anyway, you, you can SSH tunnel Sabakovich. If you do some DNS domain enumeration, you'll figure out that the dev subdomain works, uh, exists, right? And I had it redirecting, I think, to localhost. And basically, what you had to do to make this work, and again, I had to. I wound up having to give heavy hinting to make this, because this wasn't really intuitive, and it's one of the reasons I didn't like this, is you had to uh, set the, yeah, you had to set the host name, I, I don't think it was localhost actually, I think it directed the same jump box, set the host name to resolve to localhost in your own NC host file, 
SSH through your, or um, connect through your tunnel to the server, and it had to be to dev. So you can connect through the tunnel to just Sabakovich at XYZ, and it would give you uh, some standard splash page. Connect through that to dev.sabakovich at XYZ, and now you're good, right? Tangled not doesn't really match uh, practice, in my opinion, and uh, just, I don't know, wasn't thrilled with that one. Uh, and you know, I just sort of talked through everything on this slide without changing to it, so whoops. Uh, up there was how I prevented people from just logging straight into the jump box and messing around with it. It's just changing their shell to bin false. I've heard there are ways to get around it. Um, the ones I tried didn't work, so uh, it, it seemed to be, it was safe enough, I think, for me. Uh, and then this was sort of the set up of the Nginx config, where if, you, if you're coming to dev, it sends you to a different page than if you're going to anything else in this Abakovich domain. Yes. Uh, consistency was good. Containment was good. Uh, investment was pretty poor. I don't, uh, I've already explained what I thought of that. I don't think that it, uh, think it required too much hand-holding, too gaming. But, you go through that, you can pull off the server, this Manilov, another one that was okay. Um, and this was just a short challenge that where you take something called password generator up high, you take a program that generates a password and use that to build a hash cat for a profile, right? So you notice, hey, I noticed this Python script gives me this combination of characters. I'm going to set up a hash cat to brute force that combination of characters and uh, off we go. And that was, this was actually, and someone's probably going to snicker, this was my first time messing with Hashcat. Uh, so it's kind of the reason that I picked this. Uh, so this is straightforward, right? The, in the end, the answer wound up being you use this first flag to set brute force. You use that second flag to set the option to the Word document you downloaded. So this is an attack against Word document. <coughs> uh, pull in the hash and then use that character set. And then I use force because I think it was trying to use a GPU that didn't exist or something. Um, that was pretty straightforward. That was pretty minor. Consistency and containment were obviously solid. Um, not super excited about Sabakovich and Manilov. There's sort of stuff that I had to pump in in the middle to make sure that I had a connector to the next challenge, but something I'd change later. Um, I like the idea behind being a though, so I might, next time I'm thinking I might rework that into something a little more elaborate, uh, but we'll see. Anyway, so this led you to a second NFC tag. You got, it actually led you in two branching directions. It gave you a set of coordinates to find an NFC tag uh, in this document that you decoded. And so when you got to this NFC tag, it had something that looked kind of like this. Uh, and this is, so you can do this with Wireshark as well. Um, this is just a raw capture of all the opcodes coming in from the keyboard. And so it was just this blob of keyboard opcodes. And if you could figure out what the opcodes were, then you could decode a message from it, right? That was cool. Um, USB capture is something that's fascinated me and that I don't have enough of a handle on, so it was kind of neat to mess around with it on Linux. Didn't know that this uh, USB HID dump command existed. Uh, it's something I'm interested in looking at more. And this is this is really sort of a one-off. So you went off, you, you did this, you decoded the opcodes, and what you get is a password to open the zip for the final uh, event. So we've got two more. If you, the other file that was sitting on Sabakovich.xyz was this picture, actually this one up in the corner. And uh, if you ran it through exit tool, and went to the coordinates that it listed as where the picture had been taken, right? Um, then you would be within the range of this Wi-Fi hotspot, this Raspberry Pi setup. I was talking about breaking my Raspberry Pi's last night, this was one. Uh, so I, we basically, I had this Wi-Fi access point, Raspberry Pi sitting out there, and uh, it had another Raspberry Pi that would connect to it every so often and send a message. Uh, or curl, rather, curl the web server on the access point. And so you show up there, you look around, you figure out that there is an access point called Cora Bochka, and I had to, in the picture was a comment to go find Cora Bochka, which I had to do because 
eventually, I'm sure people would have just started flailing away at any Wi-Fi access point in range, uh, which would have been bad. So you figure out that there's this network that you're looking for. You can, if you were to convert that PDF of Dead Souls into a word list, the password was one of the words in the book of Dead Souls, right? So you could capture the handshake, break into the network, and now you can use art poisoning to capture that curl request sent from the first, second Raspberry Pi to the first. And if you inspect the contents of that curl request, you'll see the credentials it's using to get into the web server. Boom, you've got access and you can download the zip file for the last challenge, right? I thought this one was pretty darn cool. Uh, I, I really enjoyed putting this together. Uh, consistency was sort of iffy because, uh, and containment was also iffy because it's wireless, so I can't do anything to make you, you know, keep you from messing with the other challengers. Um, and the art poisoning was kind of finicky, but that's probably more of a me problem than anything else. Uh, so I thought this was a solid one. I think the investment would have been good if anyone had made it to this exercise. So we're kind of referring back to the initial issues I was having. Um, I thought it was cool. My testers thought it was pretty cool. They enjoyed it. I'll probably have to do it again one of these days because, uh, <laughs> like I said, no one really made it that far. Um, I think it would have been neat. I think, again, you've got the same thing where people have to run across town to find this. Uh, I think as long as they've got a solid idea of where to start, then uh, people, WPA is, is just that mix of familiar and exotic that I think makes it fun to, to break and mess with. Um, all right, last challenge. Uh, so Plushkin was a Java uh, program that was written by a friend of mine who called Grass Watcher, we'll say. Um, who's super sharp, he's a Java developer, works over on the East Coast. And he helped put together this, I say he helped, he put together this Java program uh, that was really a simple database program. And so you work through this and you get simple SQL injection, basically. Uh, and something that's super familiar to folks, um, this is an example of how you do not validate your input in Java for programs. And yeah, you can see where you can just throw in a quote and start adding your arbitrary queries. <sighs> Consistency was okay. I actually had some issues with this when I compiled it on Debian versus his Ubuntu system. Uh, so once again, no one got this far. So I'm not sure how it would have been with a bunch of people going after it. I suspect we would have had problems. Um, containment is good because everyone's got their own file and they're not messing with each other. Investment is, I don't know, uh, if you know you're near the end, do you get a high or are you kind of over it at that point, right? And uh, SQL injection can have the same effect because uh, I know if you're like me and you're playing, again, the Facebook CTF and you open up a challenge and you go, oh, they want me to do SQL injection. You have the two conflicting uh, feelings. You've got, uh, cool, I know this. And I have to figure out the query, and I don't really want to do this right now. So who knows? Uh, as a training exercise, uh, honestly, I have no idea. All right, so here's your final map, right? You start off with those three options in Azure, so it bounces you to the NFC tag, bounces you to the Sabakovich domain, where you have these two branches. One of them takes you down to get the password to that last zip file. One of them takes you to Korobochka to get the file itself. Um, and then at the end, out of that Java file, you pull the number and combination for a locker. You open the locker, you get a custom shot glass, right? That's, I realized afterwards, I should have led with that. <laughs> um, I think that would have helped my investment a lot. But anyway, so this is kind of what I learned. The biggest thing, biggest issue here was advertising. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, next time, I, I, I'm actually interested in getting some ideas for what you folks think would be a good way to hook people into something like this. Uh, I like the idea of having this, you know, QR code with no explanation somewhere. I, I like those zero context ins, right? Where you find this QR code, say, taped on the bottom, and you scan it, and it takes you to this weird website with the credit and IP. That, that I love. Um, 
but it's hit or miss because maybe people don't look at their, your QR code, maybe they don't feel like scanning it. Maybe you get one person. Shot glasses are more effective. Uh, so there's that. Um, so yeah, I got a bill from this year for $170 for the month of May, which was more than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and it turns out, I looked at my settings. Uh, to be honest, I'm still not entirely sure what's going on. If any of you had issues with is your disk read write bills, I would be interested to hear what the cause was. Uh, for me, part of it was I apparently had uh, selected, I think it's the default, one of their premium SSD slots, which is twice as expensive as a non-premium SSD slot. I don't know. Uh, anyway, watch the meter. That was something I learned. Uh, that was a personal impact and an unwelcome surprise uh, at the beginning of June. And then defining your objectives, I think, for something like this. You might have noticed this was super meandering. We've got a little bit of steganography, a little bit of SQL injection. Cool if you're creating it as sort of just some fun for folks to do. If you're going to try to train people with something like this, probably a little more focused. <clears throat> probably having some definition of what success looks like, right, would have been helpful. So those are the three things I think maybe I can tweak next time and make this a little more solid. Um, final notes. I don't know if Mr. Bankston is here. I didn't see. All right. Well. Mr. Bankston is somewhere around here. He helped me to review these slides, and uh, uh, he, he used to he's presented at some conferences in the past and gave me some uh, welcome advice. So I really appreciated that. Grass Watcher uh, did the co developing and troubleshooting. Maybe one day that will be a Twitter handle or something, and you'll start hearing about it. For now, he keeps to himself, which is why he told me to just use that handle. Um, finally, uh, there's a URL right there. Uh, if you want to jot that down, in there there's a folder called Welcome Packet. And in that is that IP address, username, and SSH key. So uh, I've got two of the challenges set up. Um, the, once again, wiped out the Korobushka pies yesterday. I was going to hide them in the lock picking village somewhere. Uh, but I did something nasty to one of them, I think, because it, it's just not talking to me at all. So that's out. But you've got the first two challenges, so uh, Nostriov and then the first set of NFC tags are somewhere around here. Um, so feel free to uh, go after that. And uh, if you drop me a note, either, uh, either a request on this repo or, I didn't put it in here, but you can, uh, I, my handle is CNTRA. If you shoot me a note on Twitter, then um, to let me know what you think, I'd appreciate it. So, questions, right? Usually, usually they pull up the question slide and there's a big question mark and I wait for you to ask me things. So I'm going to ask you things. Um, partly as a way to deflect attention from myself. <laughs> so, A, what are some good ways to get the word out, you think, for something like this? Some uh, novel, and I'm looking for novel stuff, right? Stuff that will make people sit up and go, hey, you know, that's kind of different. Not, I don't want them to be sitting, think, uh, sitting in this training thinking, well, I, I have to be here, right? Um, how would you have done this differently? And then uh, just your ideas, like how do we construct lessons and exercises, right, that are memorable, informative, and that get people invested? So, I don't know, any ideas? I'm thinking maybe you could put a QR code and a username on the side of the coffee machine. Side of the coffee. So that way whenever it's like, okay, I'm going to book a coffee, you see it constantly throughout the day, throughout the week, and you're like, okay, I have to, I have to buy, what is this? Yeah, 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 solid. I like the QR code idea a lot. It also is more mainstream than NFC tags. So uh, I like that. My, uh, the only qualm I have with QR codes, I like them for the, uh, having a long-standing CTF, something to leave up for a year or something maybe, and then gather people from the end because it takes people a while to get into them. Um, I like that a lot, and, and that's definitely what gets me going. It's trickier when you've got a quota, right? And you're like, you will start class on this day, and you will finish by this day, and I expect to have to train people by the end of it, or I'm going to come ask you, right? Something like that, too. But I'm all about the QR codes. What else? Sir, do you have to train everybody as individuals? You were worried about them colliding, but can you do team? 
Yes, and I do do some team uh, exercises. This particular one, uh, I'm mismatching. I'm kind of mismatching a little because I'm talking about an exercise I basically built for fun, and in the same breath, asking, you know, how do we do professional group training? Um, but yes, I've done. I do a little bit of both. Um, you do some stuff where they work as individuals, and then uh, once they've got a certain measure of competency as individuals, I believe is when we put them together and have them figure out how to work as a team. Uh, and then you're right, you're colliding with each other as part of the training at that point. Even that, well, <clears throat> one of the things I found about teams is that sometimes you can do a degree of cross-training, whether you pick them yourself to match people or you just let it happen. There's some training event I did, and I won't get into that because of time. But years ago, it was open and it was a big game and questions and all kinds of different things. Not quite capture the flag, but in a sense, puzzles, challenges. And we even told them up front, well, I lead with the prizes. Yeah. <laughs> like you get a t-shirt if you rank and this and that, so we got people into it. But then we also told them, we, we encouraged cheating because there would be questions all throughout the company. And so you, what would happen organically out of that was we had a salesperson come up with an engineer come up with the customer service and they'd need to go over the questions so they could answer it together. But it caused all these communication pathways to develop around our company. It was just, it was even unintended. Now I try to filter that, but that was one of the, that's why I asked about team. And sometimes that can get you a lot of buy-in, uh, either between intermediate and bit, advanced and beginners, or just across different aspects of your organization. So, so. Yeah, that's awesome. I actually love to ping you after if you've got some time, get some more information about that. What else? All right. You could do something where have a base around SQL injection and it's something low, medium, hard as it progresses through or you're building on a particular set of skill set and it unlocks different things so you, so you go from one point to another to another but it gets harder as you travel but it builds on what you've learned already. Right, absolutely. The, um, that's something the guy quoted at the beginning, John Gregory talks about. He says always start with something that student knows and then give the question or the prompt for them to move from there to something yeah, the And that, that would especially help with that bullet item I put down about having a clear objective in my mind. All right, folks. Well, I really appreciate you coming out. A um, Couple of references if you're interested. Uh, Black Hills Infosec did a solid piece on cracking office documents. Uh, art poisoning. I, went to Nullify Docker API, which I thought was probably the part of this where I had the most fun. Uh, you can find on this guy's GitHub. Uh, all these slides, incidentally, if you caught that initial GitHub link I gave you, um, are in the welcome packet. So, and the, I don't know if the slides are shared up afterwards. I know this is going on YouTube at some point, but. If you want the slides shared, we'll make it happen. There we go. So, um, and then finally, uh, something I didn't talk too much, but uh, the flip side of good teaching is good learning, right? And the best piece I've seen on that is by uh, a lady some of you probably heard of, uh, who I know is Azaria. Um, can't recommend her piece enough on how to learn uh, new skills in InfoSec in particular. Uh, so she's real solid. And that's all I've got for you. Thanks again for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference.